Hey, and welcome to another video for your unit on interaction between the branches of government. This is just more stuff on Congress. So I wanted to do one more video before we move on to the executive branch. And I want to start off with talking about the committee system. Um, as we look at C-SPAN from time to time and we see senators or representatives talk, it will say, you know, maybe if they're a member of a committee, sometimes we watch committee hearings uh, on C-SPAN. So there are committee chairs, the, ooh, they are selected through, not the rows, a seniority system. Uh, it's sort of like an unwritten rule. And there's four basic types of committees. Um, and you can go online and actually see the list of all the different committees that there are. Um, so the first type we're going to discuss is a standing committee. And a standing committee deals with proposed bills. Uh, they are permanent, existing from one Congress to the next. Um, and there's several uh, big ones. We have the um, Banking Committee. Uh, that chairman is Mike Crapo, uh, a rep uh, Republican from Idaho. We have Elliot Engel, a Democrat of New York, who leads foreign affairs. And Frank Pallone of New Jersey, a Democrat, leads the Energy and Commerce Committee. Um, examples of standing committees then would be like banking, foreign affairs, energy, governmental affairs, and appropriations. We also have select committees. They're specially created and conduct special investigations. So examples would be the Watergate Committee. Uh, the Iran-Contra investigators were select Senate committees. Um, we even had one recently, um, and I showed you this um, screenshot from a political article from past April. Um, it was a select coronavirus oversight committee. In other words, there was so much money being dedicated to um, coronavirus issues, they wanted to make sure it was being spent appropriately. We also have joint committees. They are made up of members from both houses uh, for the purpose of coordinating investigations or special studies and to expedite business between the houses. So here uh, we have um, Zoe Lofrin, uh, a Democrat from California. She's the head of the Joint Committee on Printing, which actually oversights um, what's published um, in Congress. And this has been around since I think like 1846, or it's been around for a long time. Uh, Chuck Grassley, we talked about him, I think in the last video, the Republican from Iowa, he's the head of the Joint Committee on Taxation. We also have conference committees. Um, they resolve legislative differences uh, between the House and the Senate. So some of the bills that they're responsible for is the crime bill of 94, and the Welfare Reform Act of 96, they both had to go through conference committees. And in fact, many bills have to go through this um, to uh, really see the light of day. So this is President Clinton um, signing the crime bill of 94, which had a lot of support at the time, but now it's often looked at as being one of the reasons why we have, uh, you know, overcrowded prisons and some of the reform that needs to be done with um, that system now. Okay, so we have lots of influential committees um, that are worth knowing. Um, they are determined by the percentage of party representation in each house, as far as like who is their chair. Um, so a big one is the House Ways and Means Committee. That's responsible for appropriations measures, and its chairperson is Richard Neal, a Democrat from Massachusetts. We have Lindsey Graham, a Republican from South Carolina, who is the chairperson of the Senate Judiciary uh, Committee um, that has 22 Senate members. We just saw him lead as the chairperson um, with the Supreme Court hearings uh, when we were watching the hearings of... Um, Judge Amy Coney Barrett. And we also have the House Rules Committee. So legislation in the House can't even get to the floor without a vote from the Rules Committee. So it's actually super important. Um, the only exception is if a majority of representatives sign a discharge petition. So this action bypasses the Rules Committee, but really rarely succeeds because the majority party usually puts pressure on its members not to sign this petition. Uh, the Rules Committee also allocates time for debate and the number of amendments that can be introduced 
The House can also convene in a committee of the whole, which is the entire body operating as a single committee to discuss business. Um, not used often, but it is possible. Um, so this, uh, the leader of the Rules Committee is Jim McGovern, a Democrat from Massachusetts. So most representatives are members of at least one standing committee or two subcommittees, um, and they influence legislation by holding hearings. They vote on amendments to legislation that have been referred to them. They provide oversight. They review the actions of the executive branch and all things like that. So um, here's some more information uh, about the whips. That's important. Um, so each house has a party system that organizes and influences the members of Congress that regard to policy making decisions. So the majority and minority leaders of both houses organize this by using whips. They're basically assistant floor leaders and their job is to check with party members and inform the majority leader. We already discussed majority leaders last video of the status and opinions of the membership regarding issues that they're going to be vote on. Rib whips are responsible for keeping the party members in line and having an accurate count of who will be voting for or against a particular bill. The party caucus or party conference is a means for each party to, to develop a strategy um, or a position on a particular issue. On the minor majority and minority, they meet privately. They determine which bills they're going to support what type of amendments would be acceptable. The official party position then becomes upcoming business. And they also deal with the selection of party leadership and committee membership. So currently the majority whip um, is Jim Clyburn, a Democrat from South Carolina. This is actually the second time that he's been uh, the whip uh, for the Democrats. And we have the minority whip, who I think one of our classes actually were seeing him speak before Congress the other day. And that's, uh, he was talking about how school funding is being used for the coronavirus. Um, and that's Steve Scalise, a Republican from Louisiana. Um, I just wanted to show, because we only I only showed an image of one female um, who are the female leaders of uh, in the House and the Senate. I should have mentioned the last slide that Nancy Pelosi was actually the first female to be a whip um, in Congress. So that's worth noting. This is um, Barbara Lee of California. And uh, it says there on the bottom, that, which she's the co-chair of. Um, I also thought it'd be worth noting our two senators, Senator um, Booker and Menendez, what committees and subcommittees are they on? You might have noticed um, Cory Booker was is in the Judiciary Committee because when we were watching um, those hearings, uh, with Judge Amy Coney Barrett, we saw him, you know, asking questions. Um, I don't see that. Oh wait, Cory Booker, yes. Yes, Committee on the Judiciary. I was looking at Menendez. Okay, so also let's take a second to um, talk about the filibuster. Um, so this is a tactic and it's an ongoing speech that needs a vote of 60 senators to cut it off. And that's called cloture. And what it does is protect minority interests. Go back for a second and remember what we discussed way back about Madison and minority rights and factions. And is this important for minority um, opinions or not? Um, so in 2013, the Senate changed filibuster rules and it passed what's known as the nuclear option. And so instead of requiring 60 votes, it just required the simple majority. Now, the Republicans were the minority at the time, and they were against this change. They said it weakened the ability of minorities to debate the qualification of appointees. Then the Republicans controlled the Senate in 2016, um, and the Democrats threatened to filibuster Trump's appropriation of Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court. Um, the Republicans here used the nuclear option requiring a simple majority to approve, approve Supreme Court justices. Um, so uh, with treaties, the Senate has a built-in check. Senators must approve treaties by two thirds. So let's talk about constituent service. This is something we can actually discuss for a while, but think of what is the role of someone in the legislative branch. Um, you have demographic representation, and that mirrors the desires and the needs 
of the various people that's being represented. You have symbolic representation, and that's defined by the style and message of the congressperson and how per people perceive the job that they're doing. And how responsive the, le the legislator is to the constituents' uh, wishes, it's that last characteristic. How they respond is known as their constituent service. Um, should they reflect the constituents' point of view and wishes, or should they do what they think is best after hearing all that information on an issue? Right? There's no way, according to the Constitution, that has to be. Right? Um, our founding fathers each had their opinion on it, and not all of them even agreed. So not people even all agree on that today. Um, and this comic, if you want to pause it and read it for a second, I think it really reflects that ideal. Um, but there's three different types of, constitu of constituent accountability models. So first we have the trustee model. And in there, voters trust their congressperson to make decisions that the member believes is the best interest. Like, we're voting for you. We trust that you're just going to do what's best. Right. Then you have the delegate model where voters elect their senator and representative as their delegates and expect them to vote on the basis of what their constituents believe. Like we voted for you. This is what we believe. You better vote and reflect that. Then you have the political model and that's representatives and senators are the most political in this model, utilizing both the trustee model and the delegate model to make decisions. So basically like a hybrid. Now let's talk a little bit about gridlock. Um, Congress comes under a lot of public criticism. Um, polls reflect deep voter concern over congressional gridlock. Um, they want term limits. Um, they don't like the influence of lobbyists and PACs. Um, they want reform. So of the three branches, Congress continuously gets the lowest approval rating. Yet at the same time, they keep getting reelected. People keep, people complain about them and then they vote them back in. So like, what's the deal, right? Some sort of love hate relationship. So gridlock is a problem. Congress is considered inefficient and complicated because most bills never even make it, right? We've seen the video of how hard it is for bills to get um, to the floor. Some things have made been made to help that streamlining the committee system, improving coordination, but you know, there's still a lot of gridlock. Also, Congress doesn't always reflect the views of the constituents. Um, people suggest that with the growth of the internet, representatives should get more interactive and know what their constituents believe before they really take a, you know, take a stand on a political issue. Um, representatives are also so busy, so busy running for office, like they run every two years, right? That they believe that they're beholden to special interest groups and they don't really reflect their constituents needs. And then also relationships between Congress and the presidency has deteriorated when one party is in control of the executive branch and the other party controls one or both houses of Congress. And then whenever there's a fiscal crisis, the conflict between the branches get even worse. So we'll talk a little bit about that when we get into the electing, uh, elective branch executive branch yet. Sorry, I'm stumbling a lot here as this video goes on. Um, just so you know, divided government and the issues that come from it are nothing new. Mm. So a party era exists when one political party controls the executive branch and the legislative branch. So from 1968 to 2016, which is a pretty long time, it was an era of almost continuous divided government. It was characterized by the election of a president having to deal with the opposition party and either one or both members of Congress. All right. So um, President Obama actually had the largest congressional majority since LBJ in 2008. But then, you, which often happens then, you have the midterm elections two years later, and that switched it. All right. Uh, after the 2000 election, political scientists look at what they're now calling blue states and red states. We've talked about that before the election. That was not something that was used often, um, you know, over 20 years ago. It just reflects that divide, divisiveness, I guess. Then you also have the fallout of a lame duck. Um, an example is something we did mention. Um, when uh, So a president becomes a lame duck if it's the end of his term especially if the other party is leading Congress. Um, so like right now, 
Trump is a lame duck president, even though Republicans hold the Senate just because his like days are numbered, so to speak. Um, so here's an example. When it was the end of Obama's second term, Justice Antonin Scalia suddenly died in early 2016. Um, Obama named a judge, um, Merrick Garland is his replacement, but Republican controlled Senate refused to hold hearings, asserting that the winner of the 2016 election should make that choice. And then we know what happened, right? Even though President Trump, um, uh, RBG dying right before the election and all of that. So this is just a trend, this divided government that, that is nothing new. Unfortunately, has it changed? Has it intensified? Sure. But um, it hasn't come out of the blue, so to speak. All right. So I, I hope you appreciated learning a little bit of these um, committee chairs so that when we watch them, you recognize some of them and look out for things. I didn't want to do another slide on what I'm reading because I know this video is going to be sort of long, but I wanted to show you that I am continuing to read the bo a book by Eisenhower, Crusade in Europe, if you're a World War II fan. Um, but besides about World War II, it's really reflecting a lot of issues that we're dealing with today as a nation and our relationship with other countries. Um, how we work with, how we or how we don't work with other countries and how that makes a difference on our success. So um, might be something uh, when you do World War II next year, um, I can give you some passages from it that might be helpful. All right. I hope uh, you guys are enjoying your evening and I'll talk to you soon.